quick, what does it mean to be human? 70,000 words or less? Not an easy question, is it? Sure, I admit it's loaded, but why do you suppose that is? I mean, we're all human. Doesn't that mean we get to decide what it means? If that's all it takes, it means I can tell my professors I had in my humanities classes to shove it. But it also means I wasted over 40 grand studying the topic, so maybe joke's on me. Fortunately, for those of us who studied the humanities, there's a lot more to it when exploring an honest answer to this question. And The Last of Us challenges us to do exactly this. Thanks so much for joining me guys, this is Soul Porpoise here, and today we're going to be talking about how The Last of Us teaches us what it means to be human. In the game, man's inability to conquer nature is unmistakably one of the underlying foundations of the story. You see it in the once bustling office buildings and the proudest centers of government that are now simply silhouettes of what man has done, but is no longer able to maintain. Thick foliage and sprawling vines disregard these accomplishments as nature slowly but surely reclaims its territory. So important is this theme, we discover it before we start playing the game. In the start menu, we encounter the view of a window from inside the house out. We see ivy creeping its way into the painless window that can no longer provide shelter from the outside, and wind brushes against the drapes that will never again please or displease human eyes. All while paint chips and peels to reveal the natural earth tones of the wood behind it. In one of the most brilliant start screens I have ever seen, The Last of Us communicates its main theme through one static shot. Not to mention the infected in this game didn't start from cordyceps being developed in a laboratory. As far as we know, it simply evolved to favor man as an ideal distributor. And humans are willing to do anything to stop this, even if it means sacrificing our humanity to save the human population. But with this being said, I want to be careful not to suggest that nature is seeking revenge on humanity. A narrative that preachy is best left to the James Camerons of the world. The attributes of nature are not being exceedingly cruel but instead, uncaring and disinterested in humanity. In this respect, nature plays a much less active role than a force that seeks revenge. As much suffering as Joel and Ellie endure, and as much as the player feels this unsympathetic harshness, nature continues to march on, unaffected by the extreme violence, the absence of good in the world, or the struggle for survival from two very realistic people. With all of this going on, nature continues to thrive. Insects still dance in the rays of twilight just above the earth, and the cranes still make use of the now abundant resources. And all of this is juxtaposed in a world that we now instinctively recognize as exceptionally dangerous. This theme comes at a climax in one of the most memorable scenes in the game, Ellie and Joel watching the giraffes grazing. I couldn't help but notice this mirrors the scene in Jurassic Park, which had a very similar theme of nature and how humans interact with it. And we clearly see this by just comparing these two scenes. This theme in both stories represents the role nature plays in the world, and how desperate mankind is to control it. And in what is probably the most substantial symbol of this is when Joel and Ellie watch the giraffes, who have instead of starving at the nearby zoo, dispassionately found a way to break free escaping the subjugation of humans, and ultimately, continue to survive. In this sense, nature lacks the ability to be reactive. Instead, nature simply exists, without goals, without concern for consequences, and without ears to the pleas of those suffering. The Last of Us borrows heavily from this idea, which is ultimately the foundation for the naturalist movement. The best way to describe this role that nature plays is demonstrated by the naturalist writer Stephen Crane, when he describes his perspective on the interaction between nature and man. He writes, A man said to the universe, Sir, I exist. However, said the universe, that fact has not created in me a sense of obligation. And it's emulating this uncaring attitude towards human life that makes up the collective attitudes of the people who exist in this world. Well, this goes on record as the worst fucking job you've ever taken. Seriously, you gotta take that kid back to where you found her. I can't just take her back. Then send her packing, let her find her own way. But let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, I had somebody that I cared about. A partner. Somebody I had to look after. And in this world, that sort of shit's good for one thing. Getting you killed. Ellie. What? I want to talk about it. No. Why not? How many times do we need to go over this? Things happen, and we move on. Stop. 
I get it. But whatever it is you think you're going through right now is nothing to what I have been through. I knew her since she was born. I promised your mother I would look after her. Then why are you letting this happen? Because this isn't about me, or even her. There is no other choice here. This characteristic of surviving just for the sake of surviving seems to be the general political opinion of all the characters in The Last of Us. Caring about other people seems to be a luxury of the old world. And for better or worse, each character is willing to disregard their concern for those they hurt and even kill. You know. No what? Not I've been on both sides. Uh, we'll take that as a yes. And by doing so, they are willing to sacrifice their sympathy, their ability to love, and find good in one another. This is why finding Ish's hideout and discovering his story is so disturbing and unnerving. It goes to show that the morally dubious group we only just met in Pittsburgh prior to this have better chances for survival than the only group so far that, although we've never met, we still recognize as human. The comparison between the sewers and Pittsburgh reinforces this extreme naturalistic perspective. As was explained by Henry, humans are imitating a characteristic that is generally understood to be uniquely that of nature. Yeah, I thought you were one of them too. Then I saw you. If you haven't noticed, they don't keep kids around. Survival of the fittest. The gangs are able to survive as long as they killed the weak, which included children. Whereas Ish's camp created a domain that valued children. For this reason, it's one of the darkest chapters in the game. Because if it weren't for the fact that Joel is a force to be reckoned with, the gang controlling Pittsburgh would still have been thriving because of their willingness to do away with the things that we view as sacred. And because Ish's society continued to place value in children, they were simply unable to survive. The implication of this is that in this post-cooperative world, we are unable to reveal our humanity while at the same time be able to survive, because the two are mutually incompatible. And the theme of resisting one's humanity in order to survive continues in one of the most memorable, as well as the most disturbing scenes, the Winter Chapter. Where the Pittsburgh gangs made it clear that they were willing to sacrifice their humanity out of desperation, stealing clothes and food. David's camp had what seemed to be an organized and instituted inhumanity. Where Cordyceps denies one of their humanity, driving otherwise normal people to kill and eat other humans, David's camp, a group of out-of-the-closet cannibals, does so without being effective. And what's more unsettling is the absence of desperation. So while David's camp is similar to the infected in losing their humanity, they still possess an important aspect of human capabilities the ability to outthink, farm, and hunt other animals. And it's when this aspect is indifferently applied to other humans that suddenly makes David's vignette so distressing. Our ability to outsmart other animals is something that, without a doubt, separated us from the rest of the animal kingdom in the first place. But being able to plan and predict the outcome of our actions came with it a sense of morality, the ability to be thoughtful about our actions, and to be concerned with what the impacts of those decisions are when it comes to analyzing fairness and the well-being of others. This evolved trait is something that has largely been attributed to our success as a species. From it, we were able to build cooperative societies that would eventually value a division of skills and labor that, when combined, create what we recognize to be sophisticated civilizations. But when the actions of others blatantly disregard this value of what humans have to offer, we find it to be off-putting. Simply put, there is something that humans value in each other, and as a result, we naturally view ourselves as superior to the rest of the animals. And given the naturalistic perspective and tone of the game, and considering how we frequently see the other actors as animals, how is it that we discern ourselves from being anything better or above the other animals on Earth? By what right do we get to make that claim? We certainly aren't the strongest, so we aren't superior in that respect. But we can safely say that we are the smartest, so smart, we are the first animal to create, control, and harness the energy of powerful technologies like levers, wedges, and most importantly, fire. Fire enabled us to cook, 
and through this method we were able to chew a softer meat. That in turn allowed for our jaw muscles to shrink and our brains to grow even bigger and more powerful. But our strong brains don't only give us our morality, they give us the very thing that inspires our morality. Our passions like love, fear, and hate. Scientists and philosophers call this idea an emergent property. It's an unknown, but still very real breaking point where a property, in this case, our passions, makes a physical manifestation through a complex system, in this case, our sophisticated brains. And because fire is so integral in making us human, and therefore a passionate animal, it's no wonder it's frequently a symbolic representation of humanity in literature and film. And with that said, Neil Druckmann, creative director of The Last of Us, has said that The Road, a similar story that's known for fire representing humanity, was among the inspirations for his story. So it's hard not to notice where fire is used and is not used in The Last of Us. We see it from the moment you take control of the characters in the game. Fire is ubiquitous, and so is the passion that is fear. Okay. I admit it might sound like a coincidence. What if this guy is just a disgruntled customer who has refused a refund for Transformers Age of Extinction? But more than just explosions, the game forces you to acknowledge that the out of control fires spreading throughout the city are comparable to the uncontrolled fear that's driving the characters in the beginning of the game. Even going so far as to wholly consume some. For a substantial time after this, Fire is strangely absent through the parts of the game where our humanity is suppressed and resisted. Of course, fear isn't all there is to our passions. We have other passions that have a much more practical purpose. Through the passion of love, we are motivated to be a more social species that forms connections with others. And through hate, we are driven away from those with whom our social nature will be negatively impacted, but with the added bonus that leads us to think that we would all do better in a world without the person who is on the receiving end of this passion. Our passions are the essential stepping stone that makes us who we are, more than instinct, which is simply an innate fixed pattern of behavior, and more than desire, which leads us to things that we find attractive. Our passions motivate us to take action. What The Last of Us teaches us is that we cannot ignore these passions. They might make the individual weaker, but they make society stronger, because even though our passions are an evolved trait and therefore a product of nature, we obtain something that is completely unique and special, our human nature. And we learn that it's paramount to not disregard our human nature by attempting to emulate nature. There is no richer moment that we see this than in the final fight with David. What makes David such an unnerving leader is that he, as suggested by his cannibalistic nature, views humans as prey. And there's no question that David denies his human nature to emulate nature to be consistent with the dogma taken up by the rest of the characters, as it's one of the first things he says to you in the final scene. You know, I really wish you hadn't killed James. Good kid. Just doing his job. Like all those people you killed. It's just gonna make our group stronger. You were mouth. Stronger survivors. And this is no clearer than when David takes this a step further by reducing humans to just another animal in what is now the very symbolic steakhouse, where David literally hunts Ellie. This final scene feels this way as he attempts to lure her out by taunting her. Okay, Ellie, I'm sorry about your horse. I truly am. I hope you take comfort in knowing that you won't wait for any party. <sighs> as well as using broken plates that act as sound traps. And then there is the opening and closing of this winter chapter that's so striking when considering the failure to distinguish humans from the rest of the animals. Where the chapter opens with Ellie hunting and killing a rabbit, compared with the chapter's closing, where David says to Ellie, <coughs> And the final statement on the juxtaposition of animals and humans is in why they break the action sequence where Ellie and David are knocked out and the game has you play as Joel running towards them. This implied for me, as well as I think many other players, that Joel, the executor of violence, would come in and save Ellie from David. And I think that's because we saw Ellie saving herself as something that she mentally, but more importantly, physically could not do. But in one of the most powerful scenes in the game, we see Ellie's excited human passions, in this case hatred, enable her to overpower and kill a monster. And like a broken spell from a fairy tale, 
The release of these passions are linked to the death of this extreme character, and we see a shift in the main characters as they embrace their human nature while they embrace each other. Appreciating the acceptance of their human nature is essential to understanding why the ending plays out the way it does. I don't think I have to argue very long or hard to convince anyone that Joe loves Ellie and views her as a daughter by the end of the spring chapter. Most convincing of the evidence for this lies in the same nickname he provides for her. Come on, baby girl. That he used for Sarah. Don't do this to me, baby. Don't do this to me, baby. Come on. So when Joel is confronting losing Ellie, it's not surprising that he's willing to go on a rampage to save her, even if it means sacrificing a chance to save himself as well as the human race. The thing that's so striking about this final piece of the game is that it borders on another but related philosophical hypothetical that challenges our views on another uniquely human trait, sophisticated morality. More specifically, what's being challenged here is the moral structure called utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is the philosophical view that says that what is ethical is acting in a way that creates maximum benefit for the most amount of people and reducing the suffering for as many people as well. Another way to put it is, what happened here? Your fellow hunters do this? Cute. And no, my money's on the military. Why would they mow down all these people? You can't let everyone in. <laughs> so they killed them? And dead people don't get infected. You sacrifice the few to save the many. It's kind of shitty. But this isn't always a clean cut, obvious decision. A hypothetical proposed by philosopher Philippa Foote goes like this You find yourself on a railroad stop. Five people are working on the tracks, oblivious to the fact that a runaway train is barreling down towards them. You know that if you call out to them, they will not be able to hear you. However, there is a switch in front of you that will divert the train away from the five workers, but towards one worker on another set of tracks. No one would know that you made the decision. Would you pull that switch and allow the one worker to die, or would you do nothing and allow the five workers to die? Although this is a complex question, most people end up saying that they would pull the switch, killing the one worker. Some have even argued that there's a moral obligation to pull the switch that's created simply by one having the ability to make the decision. There is a flip side to this question, however, that was later proposed by Judith Jarvis Thompson. Suppose now that you are in the same situation with five workers on the tracks in front of you with a runaway train barreling down towards them. Instead of a switch that you have in front of you, there is a very large fat man. And because you are a genius in physics, you have the knowledge that by pushing this fat man in front of the train, it will be able to slow the train down enough to save the five workers. Would you push the fat man? In this case, many people who would say that they would pull the lever would say no to pushing the fat man. There's a reason for this. It's because we find pulling the lever and the one worker dying is a side effect of your decision. In the case of pushing the fat man though, we find that his murder is integral in saving the five workers. And in the same way that the fat man's death is integral to saving five people, we find that Ellie's death is integral in creating a cure for cordyceps. The Last of Us proposes a new question. What if there is a possibility that you have to kill not a stranger, but someone that you love to save people? Assuming that your knee-jerk is probably no, how many people would you let die in order to save the one that you love? This is a much more difficult question, especially if you consider you very well may be letting everyone die. The reason we find this to be an especially tricky question is based on the philosophy provided by David Hume in his writing titled A Treatise on Human Nature. In this, as you may have guessed, he discusses the different aspects of what it is that makes us human. And related to the moral and final challenge we see Joel face, Hume dedicates an entire book called Of Morals to this topic. He makes the case that we have two different kinds of morals, which he refers to as virtues. The natural and artificial virtues, both of which contribute to us being a stronger social species. The natural virtues, being derived from the passions, help to contribute to a familial strength where love is the prime motivator. This helps to give us small but limited communities, and it's without a doubt useful. So the human species found it practical to apply similar but more complex virtues to other humans they haven't necessarily yet met what Hume refers to as artificial virtues. From this, we obtain our laws and social rules, what we would refer to as justice and judgment, respectively. The difference here is that our natural virtues are innate, built into our social survival abilities. But these artificial virtues aren't solely derived through our passions. They are also derived from our ability to reason. But what inspires our reason? Well, as Hume will famously write, reason is and ought only to be the slave of the passions. 
and can never pretend any other office than to serve and obey them. Hume is careful not to say that our reason is only influenced by our passions. Instead, he says that it's the major ingredient. So while we place value in things like honoring promises and justice, these are simply social constructs that were derived from our more innate but less tangible passions. But what happens when these artificial and natural virtues conflict with each other? On which side shall we err, since both have distinct value? In the more complex of these moral challenges, both views have been argued for and against. But there's something about not responding to our passions that we all find inherently unnerving. Take the 1988 presidential debate between George Bush Sr. and Michael Dukakis when Dukakis is asked about his wife. Governor, if Kitty Dukakis were raped and murdered, would you favor an irrevocable death penalty for the killer? No, I don't, Bernard, and I think you know that I've opposed the death penalty during all of my life. Uh, I don't see any evidence that it's a de deterrent, and I think there are better and more effective Right off the bat, many of you are grossed out by this answer. At best, he was lying to save face, and at worst, he was denying the very passions that make him human, which ends up making him cold, removed, and inhuman. But there's something tangible about the fact that we need to see someone's humanity in order to relate to and approve of their actions. And that's why the final action sequence in The Last of Us is so important. Joel begins one of the most striking and unnerving murderer's rampages we've seen so far. What's especially so disconcerting is the fact that these people aren't the gangs and cannibalistic societies we've become so accustomed to killing. Instead, this is a group of people that up to this point, many of us related to. I found it especially shocking because during my playthrough, I remember thinking at times that Joel would end up being or should be a firefly because they were fighting for ideals with which I agreed. This caused me to be reluctant the whole way through, right up to the point where I had to kill the doctor. I remember seeing Ellie there and having one of the most irrational and circular thoughts possible. I reacted to two possibilities. Either A, he had already killed Ellie and the monster deserved to die, or B, he hadn't yet killed Ellie? and I could still save her. But if he allowed me to just walk out of there without having to kill him, he should be killed because anyone who would willingly harm Ellie deserves to die. So I shot him. I shot him so fast after entering the room, I didn't realize until reading about it later that you could turn his scalpel on him. The brilliance of this final sequence is in the fact that you can't break free from it. You are forced to kill these soldiers, as well as the doctor. And considering video games are the only medium through which we can actually be offered a choice, it speaks volumes that we weren't given one. What's more is that as much as you find it uncomfortable to kill these people, there is still a moral argument to be made about how Joel is still ignoring the artificial virtue of creating a vaccine for humanity, which would ultimately end all of this. Whether you agree with Joel's final rampage or not, it's simply too messy to maintain the assumption that most stories allow us to hold. The assumption that we are playing the hero. And with this, the final naturalistic theme in the game is revealed. We no longer can see Joel as a hero. Through all of his violence and passionate killing, we are forced to see him as someone filled with flaws, passions, and love. We are forced to see Joel as human. Because of the lack of choice, we can't separate ourselves from viewing him as just a character. We are forced to justify his actions and to make them consistent with our own morality. This is something that Grant Vogel thoughtfully and brilliantly explained in his video titled The Last of Us Changed My Life, In-Depth Analysis and Dissection. And as if his contribution to the discussion on the game weren't already enough, I'm proud to introduce him to say just a little bit more. Gaining insight into Joel's moral dilemma and how this affects the player brings us back to the foundational dilemma Soul Porpoise just touched on. Should we honor natural virtues over artificial virtues? because both can be interpreted to be essential to our humanity. Just as the nurse viewed Joel as an animal for prioritizing these natural virtues over artificial virtues, I viewed her as an animal for doing the exact opposite. So which should be prioritized as being the most moral? Well, what is evident from the comments I've received on my video is that we don't have access to one agreed upon right answer. There appears to be a sort of 50-50 split between those who felt guilty for robbing mankind of a cure, and those who would stop at absolutely nothing to rescue the one emotional anchor in Joel's life. So because an argument can be made for both artificial and natural virtues, and my little unofficial survey leaves us split as to a definite answer we can make, 
It's tempting to say that the only conclusion we can draw is that we don't have any right answer. But that's not necessarily true. As Soul Porpoise will explain, there's a key moment where the right answer is revealed, and the player is already aware of it. In the powerful and emotional moment where we are tricked to believe that Joel allowed Ellie to be sacrificed when we see him driving away from the hospital after your confrontation with Marlene, I remember feeling, and I don't think this was unique to me, disgust for Joel. Viewing him as a coward who let his survival instinct get the better of him, and consequently Ellie. And by allowing us to compare this feeling with the relief of seeing Ellie in the back seat, we see how close we came to watching Joel place more value in social stability than our human nature. Although we wouldn't yet be able to articulate it in the moment, the feeling of relief speaks more than any justification for why Joel's actions were immoral. It shows we are all programmed to recognize our natural virtues before our artificial virtues. Through the story of Joel and Ellie, I am tempted to make a utilitarian argument, something about how they will share their value with others and society will be better for their story. But I'm torn because I have to admit, this is just a happy ending where I get the best of both worlds through wishful thinking. But just because this ending doesn't fall into this artificial moral system of utilitarianism doesn't mean that what Joel did wasn't moral. Because saving Ellie, while it might not have been the most moral decision, was still a decision that was moral. So what I have taken from this ending is that because of Joel's actions, it's an honest prediction to say that our civilization probably won't make it. But what I can safely say is, our humanity is in the hands of two very capable torchbearers. And beyond that, I don't know that I could ask or would ask for anything else.